Now, so now we're looking at the, the feed budget for the autumn slash spring. Effectively, yes, okay. effectively we're trying to get, no, literally afterwards. So at the minute, we're sitting at 1041. Well, That's your average farm cover at the moment. Average farm cover. Now once, I'm, I'm someone that in spring, what drives us is a spring rotation plan until you get to say the 7th of April. From the 7th of April then what drives us is our cover per cow. Once you start building grass in the yard from August on, cover per cow doesn't really matter to me. I'm just looking at cover per hectare because that's what I don't want. I want to get high enough, but I don't want to go too high. At the minute, going forward for the next three weeks until the late September, early October, we appear to be lifting to about 11.33. I don't want to go any higher. They are reasonable growth rates based on our experience here over the last number of years, plus what happened last year with this autumn. We seem to be getting more growth in the autumn. Do so so you're, you're using information, scientific information all the time that you built up on this farm? Yes. case study of this actual farm and that's what you're basing your budget on. And originally when we started I was basing it on local farmers growth rates and then as we got more information it became more ours but initially of and course. the reason I'm saying that is everyone won't have growth rates when they start so you'll always get local information and so as it improves. So, so there's no inhibitor for anyone anyone can start this at any time just get a feel ask the, lo the local advisor what what the normal growth rates are for the area so it shouldn't be a stumbling block for him to commence this but no. not have you measured before. Exactly that's, that's the argument that's exactly what I'm so doing that at 1041 now at those reasonable we think happy enough growth rates we'll get to 1133. Normally as I said our 227 cows that are here the 16 out and calf would go out straight away but we've kept them in a whole other week because we can still manage to get to that with them in. If growth rates next Monday, so there's no cow will be sold out of here till next Monday. If growth rates next Monday end up higher than the 60, so we're higher, they'll probably sit in for another week. But as soon as our growth rate starts coming down and we are not hitting the 1100, those cows are going to go out. Bringing it forward then, from then on then, we'll be looking at cows on condition score. And even though we might have to start drying off cows, I think we're taking cows out here in early October, and maybe we're being a bit conservative how many we're taking out, we're taking out something like, uh, what's 21. that, 21 cows. They may not come out, but if they need to come out, we're happy to start taking them out. And have, those, have those cows been targeted a good few weeks before this action takes place? Yes, Tom, but, but at the minute I find it hard to find the 21, but we're presuming by then some of our first calfers will need, More we'd always give first calfers here at least 10 weeks dry, and maybe some of them will be getting longer than that. We'll start calving here on the last on the first of February. So we will be we'll start looking at cows at that stage. All going well, we don't need to come in then with supplement until early October. Because once we hit the top of the hill, we'll call it, and enough grass, we want then that to last out a certain length of time. So we'll come in with supplement and all we're doing there really is trying to extend the amount of grass we have as long as we can, but equally get at least two thirds of our farm grazed in that first month. So we'll start our last rotation here the fifth of October. And, and very crudely, we'll try to graze more than two thirds, so probably 70% in the next 30 days. And what I do with groups is, because we should all be talking grass figures, but we're not. You go back and you say to people at the minute, practical advice, you say to them, you need to be, gra if you're grazing more than 3% of your farm this minute, you're grazing too much. 3% being mm -hmm. roughly a 30 day round. You have to put in enough feed or get rid of enough cows so that you're not grazing any more than 30 3 3 of your, your farm, farm a day. That'll carry you on a 30 day round to the 5th of October, if we're now, what is it, the 7th of September. Mm -hmm. And then on, that, on, the, on the 5th of October, you have to go around two thirds of the farm in 30 days. So now we have dropped back to 2% of the farm roughly, or two and a half. Then that'll bring you on to the 7th of November. I don't really care then how long you take grazing to the rest. You can spend it in a week and get in, or you can spend three weeks and drag it out. But you, that's all based on what, what your target cover needs to be at close down. Exactly. Okay. That, exactly. That, that, that'll determine how long you stay out. Yes. Well, my two thirds that I've grazed to the farm up to the 7th of November, once I get that done, I'm happy. Now, I'm given general information, we'll say rather than specific, I'm happy because that's the first two thirds you're going to go out on in spring. And if you get that done, or higher stocking, more compact calving, you have to go more than that. But if you get that done, you will have grass in spring. Now, okay. You stretch out the last third in practice probably up until the 10th of December or something and then you want the hell off of that too because that's the stuff you're going to be grazing from Paddy's day on. Yes. But the first third is the most, or the first, sorry, two thirds, two -thirds Tom, is the most important bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. What's the position in this field now, John? Um, actually, there's some bealy across this field. This is a tremendous field to pump out grass. 
So this is somewhere in our rotation. It's building up if we want to throw it, I suppose the, there's a decent cover on it. We're pushing, I suppose they're pushing 1800 cover across it. Um, I'm not sure when we'll be in here, to be honest with you, Kevin. Kevin Ahern is the man that runs this place and makes sure that we're into the quality of grass we're into, but we'll be into it whatever stage. Um, so we've no concern about it because this has been grazed. This is green all the way down to the bottom. Yes. So in practice, sometimes you go into paddocks and they're 17, 1800 this time of the year and you're worried will they get grazed out because they didn't get grazed out the last time and the time before. If you're green all the way to the bottom and nothing gone off, that will wait until we're coming in here. So if we did all like this, we'd be perfect. So that's a, a big principle. Uh, the, the people shouldn't be worried about the overall cover in the field. It's what happened in the two previous rounds. If it, if it was properly grazed out in those two rounds, you can handle a higher cover. You can, you can. But I suppose, and then in fairness, Tom, if it wasn't properly grazed out in the previous rounds, and you're now trying to do some improvement, it's where I would forgive someone for maybe cutting, even now, against all my principles of cutting in September, if he was afraid of it and it was two and a half thousand in the dungs or three thousand in the dungs and nice, and he said, and the hope I'll graze that out. I wouldn't shoot him if he cut it, but equally what I'd be saying to him in this weather conditions, you've got to learn, so go away and try to graze it. If you don't get it grazed out right, what harm? Come back in and top it afterwards. Or do, you, you, mm -hmm. I'm using the word top now, I don't want to top, but use it afterwards, because it's by pushing out the boat every year that person is going to learn a bit. So what harm? Make the mistake and end up with too high and see how you get on grazing it. Obviously you're going to have to strip graze it. Good weather conditions you'll probably work out grand. Poor weather conditions not so good, but sure you've learned something. Yes, okay. okay. So grass management isn't a perfection, it's, it's clear and understandable as you learn it, as you go along yourself in an individual basis. It is like everything. Very few people in the world bar me don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's by making mistakes, isn't it? It's by trying it out and pushing it. All we ever said to anyone with grass was, I'm not saying to you when you should go out in spring. When did you go out last year? So you went out last year, the 14th of February. So all you'd say to a fella, push it this year and see will you get out the 10th of February. And the same at the back end. When did you come in last year? We came in the 1st of November. Push it a bit and see if you can stay out a bit more. And it's about gaining confidence of what you, your own abilities and what you can do and your own ground. And then you keep pushing out the boundaries. Rather than, no one, I, no one should come in and start dictating what a farm can do. You just encourage the people that are on it and they keep pushing out the boundaries, way better than I'll ever do myself, but I'd encourage people to do it. So as you said, uh, just keep, keep small experiments in your own farm, and some will work, some won't, and you'll learn from those, and you can implement the ones that are working, and uh, learn every day as, you, as much exactly. as you can. Exactly, and it's not going to cost you a lot. It's a small mistake, it's going to be, it's going to be cost even if it goes wrong. Right. What's, have you started planning for the spring as, at this stage? We have. Um, yeah, we start planning. Effectively, spring 16 starts in August 15, if you understand that. But people sometimes say, are oh, you talking mad? So all we're doing once we hit August is setting this farm up for the following year. Setting it up in terms of cow condition. Like we said earlier, we'll take cows, cows out, we'll dry them off based on condition score, irrespective of how many days they have in milk. We we'll never get hung up on how many days to have a milk because condition score they'll go out and then we're setting it up that we need a certain amount of grass here in spring. Now, not interestingly, but as a fact, because of, our, because of Kevin here, he has made our calving more compact year on year. So last year he did a phenomenal over 90% calf in six weeks. So we have moved our calving date four days per year for the last three years. Start the calving. So we big demand here in spring, we need a lot of grass here when we calf, and we just want to calf here. We, we don't really care how much meal we have to feed here in spring, but we just want to be feeding grass and meal to cows. We don't want silage going into cows once they calf. One, too messy, too awkward from a management point of view, and bigger risk of unhappy cows in this place have a mason. So we, we want to be feeding, doesn't always work that way, but we want to be feeding cows calf, go to grass, they get meals and they motor. So we, are, we need long-winded story, we need to build up a lot of grass. So two things, we did like we start yeah, earlier. And you have, a, you have a figure for that base. Uh, I do. Yes. I've and, been that, and that's important, a farmer needs to know what his closing figure needs, needs to, be to be to have enough to feed that demand in the spring. Yes, and, and Tom, the way you say it there, you're spot on. I, I'm not actually going to say what our figure is because someone is going to latch on and say that figure is right. It may not be right for them. If you have an, a less tight calving pattern in spring, and you have good growth over the winter, you can close at a lower cover, so you can get that grass. If like here you have a tight calving pattern, you're starting calving the 1st of February, you need more grass. So two things drive us here. We start closing our paddocks on the 5th of October, get our 70% or more graze by the 5th of November, that first 30 days, and then we have a closing cover 
that we have to hit. Crudely, it's around 650, but I'm being wary of that 650. Okay. But what we find every year is when we close, we, the cover will di dictate when we close down. When you go back in spring and you go out in the first paddock and you look back and see when that has closed, inevitably it got closed before the 5th of October. So the 5th of October is just a rough guide of when you start, you shut down, it's overall so, closed and cover. Some paddocks will be closed 20 days Well, they might have been closed yeah. 10 days or something prior to that. And the other thing is, in fairness, we all talk about clothes and covers, but like a calf and pattern or like a breeding season, you need to say a clothes and cover on a date. So I say a clothes and cover the 1st of December, because obviously clothes and cover the 1st of December is different to a clothes and cover the middle of December or the middle of November, because you have more days in, yes. uh, growing. So that's what we're doing from August on. We, we're thinking of the following year and putting enough there. We will generally grow... 100, 100 is probably very conservative. We'll grow somewhere between 100 and 150 between close off and the 1st of February. So that's landing us here on the 1st of February of at least a cover of 750 and we need that. You know, and we can cope with that because the other point about that is that means when we go in every year we'll hit a paddock and we'll be wondering whether we need to graze it or not. Knowing that we're leaving, leaving too high a cover and if we leave that it mightn't be great in spring but you have to leave it. Because so, you, are, you have that figure in your head that that's going to be 150 higher in the spring and is that going to be grazable at that time? Exactly. So that's what you're basing your decision whether to graze or not graze in the autumn as Yes, well. yes. And our lesson is you have to be brave. It's better left even if it isn't nice because it's still better quality than your silage next spring. So we have left covers here of up to 1700. Not a sweep of paddocks but a paddock or two. We are happy to leave definitely 15, 16s and you have to. The temptation every year is you hit that paddock and you go, weather is nice, it's early December, let's graze it. Oh, you're taking food out of the cow's mouth the following February and it's more valuable in her mouth the following February, freshly calved, than it is at the end of her lactation. And on this farm, um, when you took over, was, what, what status was the fertility on the farm? Yeah, Tom, generally good in fairness because it had been rented out to local farmers a lot for silage, but they were minding it. So generally good. So we size samples here in, this, in January as it happens in 11 and the index is twos and threes for phosphorus. And lime relatively okay and we went about sorting out the lime straight away. But under nitrates we were only allowed to put on 90 kilos of phosphorus in total. Then the irrigation eased a bit because remember it took account of the meal going into cows. Yes. And because we were using less roughly, and I'm not exactly right on this now, you were allowed to feed 500 kilos of, they were discounting the first 500 kilos of meal you gave to cows. The phosphorus that came onto the farm and that 500 was discounted. So if you were feeding 500 or more, you really got no advantage. Yes. We were feeding less, so we got an advantage. Instead of the phosphorus coming in in the farm of meal, we could now buy it in bag for them. So that allowed us to move from 90 to 900 kilos of pea being allowed on this farm. Now another thing happened as well. We, recite, we sampled the whole farm again in 13, Every second field had dropped an index. And what was it? Was was that a shock to you? Was big shock. Well, yes and no because we all knew that 90 kilos of, of phosphorus was not going to hold up a highly stocked farm. And in fairness, that's some of the reason why the nitrates moved and took that into account. So we we have then put on 900 kilos of phosphorus, uh, 13, 14, and 15. Plus we've the lime right now, or as near as damn it as we can get right. And did it take much lime uh, to uh, to? Uh correct that deficiency? Oh, I should have Kevin here now to roll off these figures, but I'd say we've put on some time, since 11, I'd say we've put on maybe 400 tonne of lime across this 200 acre farm. So Two tonne per acre. Two tonne per acre, yes, exa yeah, exactly. And it takes lime a while, obviously, to activate, you know, you'll have, you'll have, you'll have some amount of it active straight away, and then it'll take a while to break down. So it is probably only now, with the last of our lime got on last year, and even at that, there's still a field or two that we need to top up, uh, that our lime is right, our P is getting more right, plus this place was low enough on K because of all the silage being cut off it and Kevin would have targeted those low fields getting more soil water and more slurry. So our K we're getting nearer, the way I word it is, we're given, there's, there's very few fields here now with an excuse not to grow grass. While when we started in 11 there was a good few fields that had an excuse not to grow it. They're, they're running out of excuses not to grow it. And, and we think we're starting to see the benefits because this year, to date, we're up about a ton and a half of dry matter per hectare growing this year over last year. So you see it as a, as a, big, a big bonus for farmers getting f soil fertility right within their own farm gate. It's really going to increase the tonnage grown per hectare, which is cheap. It is. I mean, you, 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 you said it earlier coming up, return on investment. 
you know, like that's direct. You, you can do the figures and work out what it's costing, and if you can get an extra ton per hectare, it's easy to do the figure on that back. I, I, do you, you don't know what it is, but it's something like, is it 20% return on investment for putting on lime, and something like 15% for putting on peas and K's. And then obviously, once, you've, once you have your basis right, have you time for this bit of an experiment? Sure. So Johnstown took a, found a field that had an index of one. When they measured the whole field, it had a P index of, it had a P parts per million of one. They split it into three parts, and on one third of it, they just got the lime status sorted out. And was, was it deficient in lime as well? Was it, it was. In, the whole it? field was short about two, I think three tonne of lime. Um, um, they corrected the lime across the whole farm, across the whole field. One third of it got nothing only correct in the lime. They came back in in three years' time, they tested it. And all the soil test is doing is trying to simulate what a, a, a root can do in getting its hands on, on pea. It had moved from one to three. So with no more pea gone on, there was now three times the amount of pea available to the plants. The middle piece, they obviously put on lime and pea, and that had risen maybe to seven or eight. But the big message is there, sort out your lime first, because you're getting more of the pea that's in the ground available, and then when you're putting on the pea, more of what you're putting on is available back to the plant, rather than getting locked up in the ground. And as you said, lime is one of the cheapest... Uh Oh yeah, kind of things yeah, you can purchase. Yeah, yeah. Lime is cheap and we're not restricted. Yeah. That's giving your biggest return and then the P's and K's next. Yeah.